Good morning. This is Mark Doyle with Word of Faith. I'm very grateful and happy to be with you this morning. Got a lot of things I'd like to share with you, but I was thinking really a lot about that one person that's listening or watching that that you're struggling with your walk with Jesus. And I think about how Jesus, you know, forsook the 99 to go after that one. And it's really been in my heart strong these days, that one that's struggling. Jesus, I don't know how to walk with you. And I thought a lot about last night about the church, the beginning of the church, the beginning of Christianity was not in a nice building with white pillars up front and everybody dressed nice and nice singers and everything working out well, but it was a struggle. It was started with, you know, betrayal and crucifixion and persecution and denial and and it, it was it was a great disruption it was a great test and trial for everybody and that's how walking with Jesus began and uh, there's a few verses that I really would like to share with you this morning that I feel like are really important for us to go back look at and read and 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 let them go into our heart again about the heart of God and in Luke chapter 4, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is this is the people that Jesus came to help. And it says in Luke 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, the anointed one. And that's who Jesus is. He is the Messiah to preach the good news, the gospel. And that's what the gospel is. It's good news for those that are hurting, struggling, not doing well. He has sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity. You know, that's what sin in our lives does. That's what separation from God, our Creator, does. It brings such calamity, such distress, such crushing in our lives to proclaim the acceptable, the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord, the day, the day when salvation and free favors of God profusely abound. This is the day for you. You who are struggling, you who want God but don't know how to go in that place in your heart to surrender to Jesus. And then in chapter in um, Mark chapter 2, Jesus was um, going to the tax, was eating at the tax collector's house. And he was a notorious uh, sinner in the land. And in verse chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And as Jesus, together with his, with his disciples, sat at table... In his, Levi's house, many tax collectors and persons definitely stained with sin were dining with him. And there were many who walked the same road following with him. And the scribes belonging to the party of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with those definitely known to be especially wicked... Isn't that amazing? The G, the people that Jesus came to and sat with and wanted to have that relationship with were those who were, were especially wicked sinners and tax collectors said to his disciples, why does he eat and drink with tax collectors and notorious sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are strong and well have no need of a physician. And Jesus is the great physician. And when you're strong in your own strength and you know how to do everything in yourself and you're confident and everything's going good, you don't need Jesus. But it's those who are struggling, those who feel the drawing power of God, those who do know that they want Jesus but don't know what to do and they're, 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 they're sick with their sin. That's who Jesus came for. But those who are weak and sick, I came not to call the righteous ones to repentance, but sinners, the erring ones, and all those not free from sin. That's how Jesus found me. He found me in that condition. And he 
in, in, in that condition, he came to me. And in your condition, he's coming to you today to help you, to let you know that he wants that relationship with you. Jesus wants to reveal himself to you, make himself known to you so that you can receive him in your heart and you can be truly born again where the Spirit of God comes inside of you and you have the power of God within you to begin to stand against sin, to be delivered from the things in your life that have brought so much heartache and so much pain. And that's the good news. That is the good news for you and me today. And so um, going on to Ephesians, this has been such a such a powerful verse for me these days. It says uh, in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, But God, so rich is he in his mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. Jesus has a great and wonderful and intense love that he has for you that he just he just wants to satisfy that love. He wants to show you that love today. And it's so important to him that you know that. It says in verse 5, Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace, his favor, and his mercy which you did not deserve. I know I didn't deserve it. There is nothing in my life that deserved Jesus coming to me and saving me from my sin. That you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation. And that's what Jesus wants for you and me. There's so many people I've talked to recently that they've been struggling. They've been having a hard time. They haven't known how to get free from certain things. And yet, and the world pulls on them, and the things of this world pull on their hearts, and they begin to doubt. They begin to have, you know, a hard time inside of them. And, I, and these are the verses that have been so strong in my heart to tell each one of them that God is fighting for you. And it's through this new birth. This is talking about somebody that Jesus comes to in their sin and brings salvation. He brings the promise. He brings the promise of being truly born again, where, where it's not just an expression that in the 20th century we've learned about. Jesus said that you must be born again to experience the kingdom of God. And so many in our churches and in and, and, and the world today, they're not born again. They have a knowledge about Jesus, just like I did. They have a, an awareness. They feel the drawing power of God. They have that desire. But that surrender, that true surrender, has never truly come. And God's come again, knocking on our hearts, knocking at our door, saying, let me in. Let me come into your life for, for good. To, to truly change your life forever. And so isn't that good? Isn't that what we want? In Ephesians chapter 3, he says that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all God's devoted people the experience of that love. What is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of it? When you truly know how much God loves you, you begin to be set free. And your life changes further. That you may really come, it says in verse 19, that you may really come to know practically through experience for yourself the love of Christ, which far surpasses a mere knowledge without experience. That you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. This is God's will for you and me, that it's not a head knowledge, a, just an awareness about Jesus, an awareness about God, but that every part of our whole being, we're just filled with God's presence and, and we're filled with God's love. And this is the will of God for you and me. This is where God's calling us. 
And we are going to say, okay, Jesus, I do want that. No matter how much the devil wars at your heart, at your mind, at your life, this is the promise of God and why he sent Jesus so that we can be that kind of a person filled with the presence of God. In Galatians, Paul was agonizing over the church because he saw that the church was struggling they were not doing good. They were Their sin was taking them over, and they were missing their true direction. They were missing the whole point of the good news of the gospel, of the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, to change your heart forever. And he said in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 19, he said, My little children, for whom I'm again suffering birth pains, until Christ is completely and permanently formed, molded within you. And so you can see where that's the heart of God for you and me, for the church today, in this day and hour, that we that God is agonizing over our over our lives, over the over his church, over his people, that we would be truly born again, completely, permanently, not up and down, sometimes doing good, sometimes not doing good but that, that Jesus would be formed within us. And so in 1 Corinthians, as he's, as he's dealing with the churches, as he's dealing with the Christians, now this is a man that persecuted the church, a man that was full of knowledge about God, but no personal relationship until Jesus met him on that road, and he met God face to face, and his life changed, and he surrendered. He stopped kicking against God. He, kept, he stopped kicking against the way of God, and he stopped just trusting in his own understanding, and he began to let that surrender come to his heart. He became, he became truly bored again, and he became a blessing to God and God's people. But this man said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, For you are still unspiritual, having the nature of the flesh, and listen to this, under the control of ordinary impulses. We're supposed to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's the whole promise of God. That's what you and I want. Ordinary impulses. For as long as there are envying and jealousy and wrangling and factions among you, are you not unspiritual and of the flesh, behaving yourselves after a human standard? We don't want to live after our human standard. And like mere unchanged man. And that's what he be, that was what he was seeing. That's what you can see in so many of Christians today. They're unchanged men, unchanged people. They're still walking after human standards. And their hearts are not after God like they should be. We are supposed to be possessed, controlled by the Holy Spirit of God if the Spirit of God truly lives in our heart, if we're really born again. And that's what we should be crying out for. God, I want that. I want that in my life. I want to change. I want to be what you want me to be, what you originally created me to be. And I cry that out all the time. Jesus, I want to be who you originally created and intended me to be. I don't want to be what this world has decided I'm supposed to be, what the devil planned for my life. I want to be what you planned for my life. And, and, and here's a key in 1 John. He's talking to the churches again, the people of God, the, the, the Christians. He says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... Here's what the world's about. The lust of the flesh, craving for sensual gratification, the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, assurance in one owns resources, resources or in the stability of earthly things. And we know that's a dead-end path these days. If you put your trust in the stability of earthly things, the world is being shaken morning, noon, and night these days. And you can't put your trust in anything in this world. And if you haven't figured that out, figure it out today. This world is falling. 
and it's the the, the world economies, the governments, the, the 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 conservatives, the the liberals. You can't put your trust in nothing but Jesus Himself, God Almighty, is our rock. He is our stability. And yet, when you love the world, you get moved by it. You get shaken by it. You you get in fear. Or you worry. Or you 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 lose your heart. And we don't want that to happen in these days. We want to get stronger in God. These do not come from the Father, but from the world itself. And the world passes away. Never forget that. This world is going to pass away. Whether it's today, tomorrow, a hundred years from now, this world's going to pass away and disappear. God said it, and it will happen. And with it, the forbidden cravings the passionate desires, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life abides and remains forever. So I don't want to pass away with this world because I put my trust in it and be destroyed with this world. But I want to serve God all the days of my life. I want to let him deal with my heart all the days of my life. And I want to be found in him when this world passes away. Whether I'm here when Jesus comes back or I leave and depart from this world before that, I want to be found in him and I want to abide with God forever. Because whoever does not abide with God and goes and is destroyed with this world will be sentenced to hell forever. And God forbid that that should happen to you or me. And in Timothy, uh, this has always been a, you know, I, through the years I've seen precious young people that I loved because God loved them. And I watched God do a work in their heart. And I watched God begin to change them. But they didn't heed this warning. And the world pulled on them and the things of this world began to, to delude them and pull on them. And they were like this man that Paul refers to. In 2 Timothy, he said, he's talking, this is his letter to Timothy, and he's talking about this one person that they both knew. He said, for Demas has deserted me. He deserted God. He deserted Jesus. He walked with the apostles. He was a minister amongst God's people. He helped. He served God. But Demas deserted God for love of this present world and has gone. And this was this was a, has been a key verse for me in many situations where where somebody that I knew God loved them and I knew God wanted to be in their life and change their life and be with them all the days of their life, but the world got them. The world took them over. They didn't guard their heart and they're gone. And I thought, you know, if you love the world, there's nothing I can do about it. And there's nothing God can do about it. He can warn you and warn you and warn you. But you've got to make that decision. You don't want the world. You want Jesus. We're in the world, but we don't have to be of this world. We have to allow God to sanctify us, to set us apart and do that work in our hearts. And, and let that deliverance come, that things that you lust after, that you love, that you crave after, let God remove it out of your heart. Remember, his desire is to show you how much he loves you. God, all that God has for you and me is good. It's all good. And that means that even if the road is difficult, if life is difficult, God wants to work in our hearts where we can walk through it steady and strong with our eyes on Jesus and not be moved by it and not run to the world or run, as the Bible says, run to Egypt for our help, but always run to Jesus for help. Always turn our hearts to him when we make big mistakes, when we make a mess. I haven't been able to clean my messes up, and I haven't able to, been able to fix my life. And I go to Jesus, and I say, Jesus, I can't fix this. Please forgive me. Please help me. Please fix this in my life, Jesus. All I'm good at, all I've ever been good at is making messes. But Jesus, you came to save me from this. And I've watched him do it for me over and over. And I know he'll do that for you. If you believe, if you trust in God, God will change your life forever. 
And every time that happens, your faith gets stronger. And the next time something comes, you said, Jesus, I know you did that for me there. And I know you'll do it for me here. And we put our trust in God. And so it says, Paul says, after he's talking about Demas, he says in chapter 2, in the verses right before this, as to what remains henceforth, therefore is laid up for me the victor's crown of righteousness for being right with God and doing right, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me and recompense me on that great day. And not to me only, but also to all those who have loved and yearned for and welcomed his appearing, his return. And that's what we want to be like Paul. Paul, he, every day of his life, after being such a wicked man, he set his heart on that prize, that on that day that he'll stand before God and he'll get that victor's crown. He'll have done what is right in the eyes of God. And that's what how we want to live. We want to live our lives like that. And um, in 2 Chronicles, God says in chapter 29, verse 11, he's, God refers to us and he says, My sons, do not be negligent and don't be careless. I mean, we live in a careless generation. You know, just relax. Just do whatever you want. Don't, don't worry about these things. Don't be all worked up and uptight. And, and that's a careless life. But the Bible talks about having a sense of urgency and knowing the day and hour that we live in. Recognize the seasons and, and the warnings of God because we have this one life to live and how we live it determines forever where we spend throughout eternity. So I don't want to be careless. I don't want to treat it lightly. Life is too short. It's too serious. It's too important. It's my test and my proving before God Almighty of how I'm going to live it. And I've definitely lived a lot of it, wasting a lot of time. But these days, I have an urgency in my heart. And I want to take that urgency seriously. And he says, my sons, do not neglect. Do not be negligent and careless now. For the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence. What an honor. What a privilege that God has chosen you and me. Don't let the devil lie to you and say that God hasn't chosen you. God says he wants everyone to be saved, but not everybody will be saved. Not everyone. Many are called, but few are chosen, the Bible says, over and over. And I want to be chosen by God. I want to be found in him. My sons, do not be negligent and careless now. For the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to attend to his service, serving God. Whatever you do, from a truck driver to a plumber to, to singing in the church to, a, to, to whatever God has you do, we serve God to be his minister. That's what God's called us to be, to stand before him. And uh, in, in Matthew Jesus begins to warn us. He begins to speak to us. And he says in chapter 7 of Matthew, in verse um, 13, he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad and easy to travel is the path that leads the way to destruction and eternal loss. So we see in life, there's a path we can walk. There's a way we can go, and it's easy. But the problem is, is it leads to destruction. And that destruction is eternal loss, forever, forever to be lost, forever to be separated from God, to forever to be destroyed. And I know Mark Morris has preached on heaven and hell, and, and, and hell is real. And I don't want to spend eternity there. And there are many who enter through it. Many. But small is the gate, and narrow and difficult to travel is the path that leads the way to everlasting life, and there are few who find it. Set your heart today. Jesus, I want to find that narrow path that leads to life. You know, let God deal with your heart. 
And don't take the easy way, the broad way, the wide way. There's no persecution there. There's no mocking. In fact, the world will love you, accept you, speak kindly and highly of you if you go that broad and wide way. But if you walk that straight and narrow way like Jesus, that you will be persecuted, you will be scoffed at, you will be mocked, you'll be lied about, but you will experience God's overwhelming love for your life. And you will go through situation after situation that is impossible. And you will see God move in your behalf. You will hear his voice. You will experience his presence. And it far outweighs anything that this world could offer. There's no way to describe it. There's nothing better, nothing better than to know that you did God's will and that he's pleased with you. And you can experience that. You can experience that. It's a real thing. There's no high in this world. There's no experience, no rush, no anything that can even compare than to feel God's pleased with you and that you have his approval. There's nothing better. And that's what we're pressing on to. That's what we're fighting for. That's what the devil does not want you and me to experience because he knows once you do, it will be your great pearl, of great price. That all these things of the world will be it will fade and become nothing to you when you ex- begin to experience how much God Almighty loves you and is fighting for you and wants to have that personal relationship with you and wants to spend eternity with you and he wants you to go to heaven that's that's far surpasses anything in this world but the devil's a liar and the seduction is real in fact we live in the day now where it says with unlimited seduction to all kinds of evil the devil will come after everybody and you can see it you can see people who once professed to know jesus to want jesus they don't even believe in god anymore They didn't believe he's real anymore. And it hasn't changed him from being real just because they don't believe it. He is real. And he's making himself known to everyone that's crying out to him. And in this day and hour, it says the darkness will get darker. And the lightness, the light will get brighter and brighter. And that's what you and I want. We don't want to walk in that narrow way. I mean that broad and wide way. We want to walk in the narrow way where God is. And his presence is. And it's okay to go through difficult times. It's okay. It's okay for for things to happen that prove our hearts and test us. Because if we cry to Jesus, we watch the hand of God move like never before in our lives. And he becomes more and more real and more personal in our lives. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 10, For For let him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, whether apparent or not, so whether they seem good or not, keep his tongue free from evil and his lips from guile, treachery, or deceit. We want to live truly and we want to speak truly. Verse 11, let him turn away from wickedness and shun it and let him do right and let him search for peace harmony, undisturbedness from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts, and seek it eagerly. Do not merely desire peaceful relations with God, with your fellow men, and with yourself. That war that you have within yourself. But pursue and go after them. Go after that right relationship with God with everything in you say and if you don't know how say jesus i don't know how there's nothing better than to go to your room and close the door and lie down on your face and talk to god and 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 if you don't know what to say just say jesus i don't know what to say i don't know what to do but i need you Help me. And that is the beginning of pursuing and going after. It says, For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, those who are upright and in right standing with God, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who practice evil, to oppose them, to frustrate them, and to defeat them. And we don't want to be that person that is frustrated all the time. We want to be that person that is seeking God. And Jesus will help you if you seek him. He will deliver you 
And he wants to know that today he's offering to you once again his salvation to change your life forever. Don't reject him, but welcome him and receive him. I'm so glad you could listen in today. I hope this helped you. We rec- we have recorded all our um, morning times with you, and they can be found on our website at www.wordoffaithfellowship.org. Thank you, and we love you so much.